this bag of bones. And I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a bag of bones. And just when I
this Easter Sunday morning, God, we come to give you praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, let's give the Lord a big hand clap of applause. Aren't you glad to be serving the Lord? Oh, lift up your voices and praise him. God is great and greatly to be praised. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Hallelujah. Nothing quite like Easter Sunday morning coming into the house of the Lord with the body of Christ and remembering the resurrection. Of course, you don't have to remember too hard because if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, He's right here. He's in your life. Nothing like the Spirit of the Most High God. Nothing like it. Hallelujah. I want to welcome all of our guests to First Pentecostal Church. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for coming out today. Best way to enjoy Apostolic Pentecostal Church is just look around and what other people are doing, get busy doing it. And just make sure you're offering it to the right source. It's to Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To all of our folks that are watching online today, thank you so much for being a part of Easter 2024 here at First Pentecostal Church. Again, I, I encourage you to get those feet off the coffee table. Hallelujah. Get your hands up in the air and thank the Lord. Hallelujah for being a part of your life. Praise the Lord. We're going to have other folks coming in probably for the next 30 minutes. I was talking to somebody right before service, and I said normally about... Um, you know, about 25 after 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, you got about 20% of the church here. And about 20 minutes later, you got about 30% more. And then about 10 minutes later, you got about 80%. And then everybody comes on in. And I explain that it's the big easy. Everybody, those that plan to be on time are a little late. Amen. <laughs> if you plan to be early, sometimes you get here. But you can't find your shoes sometimes, and you're just a little bit late. So we are so glad to have you today. We're going to have a great, great Easter celebration today. God is going to do wonderful things. Hallelujah. Why don't you just reach around close by. Don't get out of your seat. Just reach around and shake two or three hands close by to where you are. Don't get out of your seat. If you get out of your seat, I'll never get you back where you're supposed to be. Hallelujah. Let's come back to order. Oh, Lord, we love that fellowshipping. Nothing wrong with that fellowshipping. Hallelujah. Well, we always say this is the friendliest church in town, and I believe that's true. Amen. Praise the Lord. Reach over, join hands with your neighbor. Lord, I'm asking you to send forth those mighty warring angels of heaven. We're about to bring our tithes, our offerings into the storehouse of the Lord. And you, mighty God, are about to rebuke the devourer. You're going to send the devourer on down the road. He's not welcome at First Pentecostal Church. I speak mighty blessing upon the children of God here today. Physical blessing, spiritual blessing, emotional blessing. Lord, even financial blessing. Let it chase your people down. I pray these things in the authority and in the power of the name of the Lord Jesus. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah. For those watching, you can give online. Just get your tithing, your offerings together in the church. Let's march and bring them to the Lord with rejoicing.
in the storehouse of the Lord. Bless the people that gave it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Paul. Corinthians chapter 11 verse 24 scripture reads and when he when Jesus had given thanks he broke the bread and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. The point here to this reading is these are reminders of all that Jesus sacrificed for our benefit. Verse 27, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You know, when you look at this word unworthily, this refers to taking communion without proper reverence. If we do this, we are guilty of just going through the motions. It serves no purpose at all. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body or not understanding what's taking place here. Verse 30, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Really, there are many folks in graves today because... They didn't remember and understand all that Jesus sacrificed for them and why he made that sacrifice. If these had remembered the all and the why, they would have known that there was healing in the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we took the cup, they could relate to the beating, the horrible beating that Jesus took so that we could be healed of sickness. If they would discern the Lord's body and, and see what he went through as he hung on that cross, then they would take advantage of the salvation message and would choose to live for him instead of for themselves. Does that make sense? So before we take communion tonight, today, I want each of us to do a couple of things. First, I want you to search your heart and ask God to forgive you for any sin that is within you. Let's do that right now. Lord, search my heart. If I've offended you in any way, I'm asking you to forgive me. If I've done anything that's brought displeasure to you, Lord, forgive me. I want to be right with you, God. I want you to be pleased with me, Lord. I want to stand before you in the beauty of holiness, Lord, that holiness that you you are the only one that can bring that to our lives. We can't get good enough to be holy, Lord, but we can, we can include you in on our lives and you can make us holy. And so, Lord, we take advantage of these things that you have offered. All right, everybody should have received a cup when you came into the church today. There's two little sections to it. There's the top part that brings you to the wafer part it's a type of the body and then there's the second part so I would encourage you to pull that top part off right now take the wafer out wafer out and then remove that second part very carefully okay are you ready you ready to take communion Lord, this we do, repeat after me, Lord, this we do in remembrance of you. You may take the bread and you can take the cup. Lord, 
Lord, we love you, Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifices that you made for us. Thank you for giving your life so that we could find life. <laughs> Thank you for ministering to broken souls, Lord, and to making us brand new, Lord. We love you so much, Jesus. We thank you for your greatness. <laughs> we love you, Lord. Anybody feel like telling the Lord Jesus, Lord, I love you. I love you with all of my heart. Hallelujah. You are faithful to your people, and we honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated.
He is the Word of God, the prophet, the servant. He is the bread of life, the shepherd and the lamb. He is the messenger. He is the humble king. He is the son of God. He was rejected and abandoned. He was betrayed and condemned. He was mocked and beaten, bruised and pierced. He was crucified and buried. But the nails could not hold him. The cross could not finish him. The stone could not keep him. Death could not defeat him. He is our ransom and our redeemer. He is our deliverer and our refuge. He is mighty. He is glorious. He is holy and exalted. He is our Savior.
son. Praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated. I have a baptismal certificate here today for Melvin Bell. Is Melvin here today? Hey, Melvin. Come on, buddy. Congratulations, Melvin. Why don't you stand right here? Look this way. Look this way. Thank you, Melvin. God bless you. Hallelujah. I've got a Holy Ghost certificate for Lynn Dufresne. Lynn received the baptism of the Holy Ghost a couple services ago. Amen. Come on, my sister. God's good, isn't he? <laughs> Congratulations, young lady. God bless you. Come on, let's turn around. Let's take a picture. Now, I've got two certificates for Anitra Williams. I've got a Holy Ghost and a baptismal certificate. How you doing, young lady? God bless you. Here's your certificates. Let's just hold them up for them. girl's taller than me. I'm telling you right now. I used to be 6'2", but I've shrunk a little bit from 6 to 7 years. Now I'm 6'1". <laughs> Hallelujah. And then we've got a baptismal certificate and a Holy Ghost certificate for Brianna Cyprian. How you doing, young lady? Congratulations. Here you go. Just put those that way. Thank you. God bless you. I don't think there's anything I enjoy any more than giving out those Holy Ghost and baptismal certificates. I'll tell you what. Praise the Lord. Well, we've had a good service. If we all went home right now, we'd felt like we came to church. But I think we need to get into the Word a little bit and see what God has for us. Hallelujah. In the book of Romans, chapter 4, we find the Apostle Paul's letter to the apostolic church. And when I say apostolic church, We've got to understand that when the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, the church was now with power. And the apostles carried that gospel to the ends of the earth. And so it's because of that power of God that's in us that gives us hope of making it there and walking down streets of gold and walls of jasper. Amen. So his letter is to the apostolic church of Rome, and we take it up in verse 24. If we believe on him, on the God that raised up the man, Christ Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. I could get into uh, explaining all of that. Jesus was both God and man in that his father was of heaven. Mother was earthly. So he was God and man. But verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses or sins. He was delivered from this world into, into another. And it was all about our sins. And was raised again for our justification. Or in lieu of our faith in God's promises. Our faith in his unmerited favor and grace. And in chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ 
by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, this unmerited favor, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope. In other words, we've got expectation of the glory, the rejoicing of God. And then in verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work patience. We don't like to go through tribulations, but we understand that they're bringing something good our way. And after patience, we receive experience, and then experience, after experience, hope. And then it says, hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. My subject today is a very simple subject. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to minister today in a powerful way. Minister to hearts, minister to minds, minister to lives. Let us realize, God, that there's always a better way through you. We love you so much. I pray your blessing on the remainder of this service. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. I believe that we'd all agree that there have been many vital discoveries during the last 100 or 150 years or so of our history. Got to looking through some books this week and found that Alexander Graham Bell on March 7th, 1876, successfully received a patent for the telephone. And he secured the rights for this discovery. 1879, the light bulb. I think we appreciate the light bulb. We've got 153 of those puppies just in this auditorium. They are LEDs, so that's good. If we didn't have that, we'd be spending a whole lot of money on electricity bills. 1896, the wireless radio. 1948, penicillin. I think that was a pretty good discovery. 1712, the steam-powered engines. We don't use those a whole lot anymore. But in 1860 came the gas-powered engine, and I think we just about every single one of us used those except for A.J. Galvin. <laughs> He's driving one of those, what do they call that thing? Uh, an EV, that's right, an EV. And yet there's one discovery that was truly God-sent that has changed the eternal plight of man, and this discovery was revealed in a manger in Bethlehem. What I've come to realize is so very many today are spending so much of their time just racing through life with little to no interest in the hereafter. And I assure you today, there is a hereafter. And this is how this God-sent gift came to be. God's Spirit overshadowed a young virgin named Mary. She was then found with child. Nine months later, we have a birth that could actually change eternal destinations. Where before eternal torment was the world's plight, now there was made a way for individuals to escape. Thank God for making a way. Many and perhaps most have heard about the death of Jesus. When the Hollywood production of The Passion of the Christ hit, it was truly a smashing success. This picture was so broadly distributed that, and so popular that to date it's been dubbed in 2,000 languages. I'm talking about many have seen this film. More than 600 million after watching this film had an awakening concerning Jesus. In other words, they were aware that, hey, something eternal is taking place in our world before our very eyes. Over the last five years, one of the great examples of the interested in Christianity is a series named The Chosen. Anybody heard about that? This series is not financed by Hollywood, but by the public, with many of the actors professing to be Christians themselves. 
I'm saying that there are multitudes focused on Jesus today, and there's great reason for this. Romans 5.20 said it like this, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Wickedness, gross immorality, perversion, disdain for the ways of God are on full display. And yet, in spite of this, interest in this Jesus business is booming. You see, masses of people are recognizes that our times today are different than all others. I'm telling you, Jesus is about to return for his bride And these are beginning to cry out for the Almighty's help. God, we need you. Lord, we're confused. We don't understand what's taking place in our world. Will you help us? And I've got news for you. When you cry out to the Lord, the Lord will not ignore that desperate, hungry, needy soul. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who had done no wrong, In fact, he had healed multitudes of sickness and horrible disease. It was this Jesus who was the one who walked to a tomb where a four-day dead dead man did lie and, and he called out, Lazarus, come forth. And friends, that man who had been dead, he came alive again. Jesus was the one who cast out demons, bringing peace to tormented souls. And and yet the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and scribes found him a monumental threat to their religion, so they saw fit to crucify him. And yet Jesus had already prepared his followers for this event. Matthew 16, 21, we find Jesus with his closest. And listen to what Jesus was talking about here. It goes on, it says here, from the time forth, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, but he didn't stop there. It goes on to say, and be raised again the third day. What was he doing? He was preparing his people. Matthew 17, 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be portrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Luke, 7, Luke 9, 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And just as Jesus said, his life was taken, and it was taken in the most horrible of ways. His hands and feet were literally nailed to a cross of wood He then hung there six long hours until his heart ruptured within and death took him. From Jesus' death we find in Matthew 27, 57, when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph who also himself was a Jesus disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus And then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb. For many of Jesus' followers, their mindset was, it's it's finished. Now, don't forget, he reminded, he told them every step of the way, I'm going to die, but I'm coming back. So, but there, still, there was something in that they couldn't grasp that. And so they, it's over. There's no hope. They had seen the results of his scourging, his back laid open with a cat of nine tails. They had witnessed the crucifixion. Jesus was truly as dead as dead could be. And yet the ones who had slain him 
thought to take extra precautions. Matthew 27, 62 said, Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went, they made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. I got to dig in a little bit this week concerning what took place here. The point here is the Roman guards were to ensure that there could not be a grave robbery. So they first came to inspect the tomb to make sure that the body was still there. When it was, they rolled a stone back into place and then they sealed that stone. It was sealed with a cord stretched over the stone covering, a cord that one end of the cord was attached to each side, to one side of the the tomb, the other end of the cord was attached to the other, and it was made of clay, and then there was a Roman insignia stamped into the clay. Then came the guards themselves. Okay, they've, they've got the tomb sealed. A Roman guard unit consisted of 16 soldiers, Four men were stationed immediately in front of the object they were to protect. The other 12 slept in a semicircle in front of the four. Every four hours, a new unit of four was awakened, and those who had kept watch then, they went to sleep. This routine continued around the clock. To steal what the guards were protecting, these would first have to walk over those who were asleep, then they had to deal with the guards who weren't sleeping. How about the stone that covered the tomb? In Mark's account, we find the stone to have been extremely large. The apostle John used a word that means to pick something up and carry it away. The point being, the stone wasn't only opened, it was found far from where it should have been. Normally, it would have been simply rolled into place. But friend, it was over to the side, and if you study it out, an angel was sitting on the stone. How about the sepulcher itself? The scriptures tell us it was empty. The resurrection could never have been believed if there was a body still there. So what became of it? Would the authorities deliberately remove the body to prevent the disciples of Jesus from claiming it? or from claiming that it had risen? Did the disciples steal the body of Jesus as a hoax, as an attempt to deceive people into believing that Jesus had risen? Impossible. Simply because the disciples were prepared to suffer and die for the gospel, and people don't become martyrs for a lie. Think on that. Also, they went straight to Jerusalem. Word of the resurrection could not have been sustained in Jerusalem for even a single day if the empty tomb was not an established fact. Then there was the shroud that wrapped Jesus' body. The grave was not empty. The grave clothes were still there. When John leaned over and looked into the tomb, he saw something that startled him where the body of Jesus had lain There were in the place, the grave clothes, and yet they were still in the form of a body. Yet slightly caved in. Those grave clothes were empty. John never got over this. The first thing that stuck in the minds of the disciples wasn't the empty tomb. It was the empty grave clothes that were undisturbed, still in their form and position. One look at the grave clothes proved the reality of the resurrection. Then came the time when Jesus appeared to his disciples behind closed doors and showed how alive he really was. When Thomas, who was absent the meeting, heard about Jesus showing up, he just could not believe unless he could see Jesus as well as his scars. 
Jesus, on the following Sunday, showed up addressing his doubting disciple. Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. The scars so convinced Thomas and the other that there was no denying it, and they were transformed. And then there were the Jesus sightings. Y'all hang with me here. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, the apostle Paul writing, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. No question about it, Jesus rose. People have pontificated and talked about this and said impossible, no. Too many witnesses. Dr. Frank Morrison, a lawyer who held the opinion that the resurrection was but a fairy tale ending that spoiled the matchless story of Jesus, felt that he owed it to himself and others to write a book that would present the truth about Jesus and dispel the mythical story of the resurrection. Yet once he studied the facts, the evidence compelled him to conclude that Jesus did rise from the dead. However, Morrison still wrote his book, yet the new title was, Who Moved the Stone? The first chapter is called, The Book That Refused to Be Written. I'm preaching today about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I have great news. Jesus still lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As he walked and he talked with his disciples in yesteryear, he's still walking and talking and living within those who've repented of their sins, taken on Jesus' name in baptism and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit into their lives. Understand this. I want to say it again. Jesus is alive And he's in this church house today. He's alive in people's lives. And if you haven't received him into your life, he wants you to come alive in him. He wants you to know that there's a better way. And that better way is through him. Before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there came a day when Jesus was with his apostles preparing them for his great passion that was certainly on his way. And, and he said in John 14, 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. So he's sharing these great truths and And yet these obviously didn't grasp what Jesus was saying. We know this because verse 8 went on to say, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, I want you to plug in right now. Jesus saith unto them, have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I'm going to my Father. And here's a, here's a biggie. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything, I'm telling you that includes everything. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. What are we talking about now? We're talking about the Holy Ghost, that he, abide, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but she knoweth him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Today we have access to the greatest gift ever given to man. We have access to God in us. The hope of glory. Friends, if you've got God in you, all things shall be possible. If you've got God in you, you can overcome whatever this world brings your way. If you've got God in you, no temptation can bring you down. You say, I'm afraid I can't live this. You can live this if you've got God in you. Our whole world has become a messed up place. And yet those that have God in them and have the blood applied to their lives, they're going to go with the Lord when the Lord comes back for his church. Friends, I've got to be ready so that I can go with him. Amen. Let's stand. I've been doing this preaching business for 46 years now. And I've never seen in all of my years a world that's as messed up as it is today. Amen. Brother Sarton, I've got to live in this world. I've got to, I've got to go to some places that I, I don't know if I can live this life. It's, if it's just you trying to live this life, you're right. You, you, you can't live it. But with God in you, all things are possible. All things are possible. So many are living empty lives, barren of peace, barren of lasting joy, barren of protection that only God can bring. Understand this great truth. God loves you. He loves you more than you can imagine. In fact, he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I thought I'd ask some questions this morning. What have you come needing today? You say, well, Brother Zorn, that's, that's I got some big stuff in my life that I need God to take care of. Nothing too big for God. Nothing too insignificant for God. So what do you come needing today? I'm telling you, if you'll say yes to the Lord today, the Lord will say yes to you. And he'll begin opening doors in your life that have never been opened before. He will begin making a way where there seemed to be no way. I'm telling you, he will hedge off things that, that would destroy you and give you respite. 
so that you can live for him victoriously. Again, what do you come needing today? And if you have needs in your life, do you understand that Jesus will help you? Why do you think he came from that tomb alive? Why did all of that happen? It was so that he could minister health, so that he could minister life into the lives of people in this world that for their entire existence had served only themselves and those things. So first, if you have needs in your life and you want Jesus to help, he will. Let me step out here and, and say if you're sick in body, I believe he will heal you. If you're living a broken life, no telling what you've been through, if you've had heartaches and heartbreaks and, and this has ended and this has started and that which was started before you hardly knew it, it ended. And if you're living a broken life, a barren life, an empty life, I'm telling you, one touch from the Lord will mend all of those wounds. He will, heart, he will begin helping you. You say, but brother, you don't understand. I'm in complete turmoil. I'm going to tell you what. Jesus walked to the bow of a boat. One day they were in a horrible storm. His disciples were just so nervous, so scared. And he just spoke to the wind and the waves. And he said, peace, be still. And instantly those waves begin to come down doesn't matter what's going on in your life if, if you'll make up your mind today I'm willing to repent boy that's a big word let me tell you what it, repentance is all about it's, it's just turning over the leadership for your life to him it's saying Lord I've, I've made a mess of things all by myself but Lord, uh, Lord I'm going to turn over the reins of my life to you Lord and and if, Lord, you'll forgive me, Lord, I commit myself to listen to you when you direct me, Lord. Repentance is not just about saying I'm sorry. Repentance is about giving the Lord control in your life. And if he says go left and you want to go right, you say, no, I'm going left instead. So let me ask this question. If you want God to perform a miracle in your life this morning, and you have faith to believe that God will help. I'm asking that you just step out boldly and make a move toward God. In doing that, you're taking a step of faith. You're taking a step of faith. If you've got any kind of need at all in your life today, and you want the Lord to work a miracle for you, work a healing for you, work a deliverance for you, will you come? Will you come? Will you come? If you need a breakthrough in a marriage, if you need God to open a door that's been closed to you, will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Don't block the aisles. Just keep on coming up. Just keep on coming up. Hallelujah. If you need God to make a door where there seems to be no door, seems to be no way, come on, step on up. Just keep on coming. Hallelujah. Don't block the aisles. Just keep on coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep on coming. Just keep on coming. We're going to pray in a moment. Just keep on coming. This is a statement of faith. You're saying, God, I can't do this on my own, but I can do this through you. I can do this through you. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Come on. Come on. Come on. Keep on coming. Don't block the aisles. Let everybody get up as close as they can. Let everybody get up as close as they can. Now, everybody in these altars, this is what I want us to do. I want us to just repent. I want us to say to the Lord, Lord, I've made a mess of things. And, Lord, I need you to take over. I'm, I put my life in your hands, Lord. Forgive me for every wrong that I've ever committed. Forgive me for every error that I've ever made. Just begin to talk to the Lord like that. And what you're saying to the Lord is, Lord, I'm giving you free reign over my life. That's it. Just begin to repent. Just begin to talk to the Lord. 
That's it. Just begin to talk to him. Just begin to talk to him. That's it. Hallelujah. Just begin to talk to him like that. Hallelujah. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you feel like the Lord is forgiven, you begin to lift up hands right now. Begin to lift up hands and say, Lord, I want all that you have for me today. That's it. Begin to say to the Lord, Lord, I want all that you have for me today. That's it. Begin to talk to the Lord. Altar workers, hallelujah, pray for people. Hallelujah, begin to pray for people. You're looking.